Okay, let's start officially. Uh, good morning, afternoon, and evening. Hola, hello, bonjour, hola. Ni hao, konnichiwa. Annyeonghaseyo, and hello all. Welcome and thank you, Sambis people, for joining us, the 111th seminar, and I call it a general cell day. <clears throat> Time nearly flies. The first month has already passed, although 11 more months left in 2024. I hope all of you are moving forward, achieving your New Year resolutions and goals. My goal is to improve the academic culture and global collaboration by traveling again and connecting with researchers all over the world as I have done since 2021. And today's the pioneer speaker is Dr. Scott Behe. He is the scientific editor at Cell, one of the most famous and impactful journals in the world. Because of the Cell journal policy, we decide not to record the part of his talk, but he gave very useful, you know, you know, advice to us. So I hope you know all the audience enjoy that part of the talk. Okay. Now the main speaker of today with a longer introduction, Dr. Christian Meyer did his undergraduate in physics at Colorado State University before moving into cancer systems biology for graduate school at Vanderbilt University. There, he secured the NSF Graduate Student Fellowship, one of the most you know, competitive you know, fellowships uh, for the graduate student, and derived a consensus framework for calculating drug synergy called mu uh, six. After graduating, he moved back to Colorado, but this time to the University of Colorado Boulder. Christian discovered bacteria use the physics of phase transitions to regulate calcium flux and invented a new high throughput method for measuring microbial viability. Christian subsequently secure a K99 pathway to independence award from NIAID, another very competitive you know, award uh, for the postdoctoral researcher. Currently, he is using his high throughput viability assay to discover novel antimicrobial strategies by leveraging a combination of high throughput experiments, machine learning, and systems biology models. Christian, thanks so much for your time today, and please take it away, all yours now. Thank you. Thank you so much. What a pleasure to be here, and uh, a huge thank you to Scott for uh, great insights into the editorial process. Certainly, I, I can't think of an, a manuscript I've published that hasn't benefited from the editor's time and efforts, so thank you, Scott, for all the work you do. And I, it's wonderful. So um, I'm very excited to share uh, our work today. I found it's helpful for audience members to have access to the slides as I go through them. So uh, this QR code, if you take a picture of it, it will take you to this slide deck. Uh, there's also a URL link uh, if uh, you can type it in. But the work I'll be talking about is about, as was mentioned, this high throughput, low waste viability assay. Um, and I cannot acknowledge all the wonderful people who've contributed to this work, um, but this was truly a collaborative uh, effort and I'm so grateful for all their time and efforts. Um, before I begin, some disclosures. I am a co-inventor on a patent on this technology as well as several um, biotech companies. And this article has now been published. There's an article link which is active. Um, so if I uh, feel welcome to come read it um, and I hope you enjoy uh, the work. So, 
I want to begin this, and, and Scott really set me up by saying we need to start with scientific storytelling. So the story I want to begin with is uh, the observation that we live in a world of microbes, arguably much more interesting than we are. And if we could put on a pair of glasses that would allow us to see the microbial world around us, I think we'd have a very different view of our maybe hand-washing abilities, but also of the diversity and, and amazing uh, kinds of organisms that live underneath our nose, quite literally. Um, so I want, but the problem with this vision, like if we could make these glasses a reality is that it's really hard to count something so small as a microbe. So how people have been doing this hasn't changed in basically um, over a hundred years. And this is uh, a, a bane of graduate students and postdocs alike, but in order to count bacteria, the most common method is the CFU assay. And so what you do is you take your sample and you dilute it and you dilute it again and you dilute it again and each dilution, then you put spots onto solid media and allow co colonies to form. So you're allowing single cells to grow up into colonies and that colony formation then is the measure of how many viable cells were in that sample. So this would be an actual experiment that would look like this at the uh, highest Christian, concentration. Yeah. I'm sorry. So far, I understand everything you said, but with the slide, it's better you should share the slide probably from now. Okay. Am I, are the slides Sorry, it's not shared? shared yet. Oh, okay. Well, let me, I don't think I shared slide. There we go. Well, so far, I appreciate you. You, know, you. you did very nice storytelling, so I don't need slides. Okay. Well, from now on, I'll, I want I will to see. I'll start again. So this was the slide that you should have seen. You're welcome to take a picture of that QR code. There's the slide link that'll get you to the slide deck um, that you can see. And then uh, these were my disclosures, as I mentioned. Um, and then this is the picture to preface this idea of the world around us, that we live in a microbial universe and the way in which we interact with that universe uh, is largely through trying to grow these things large enough that our our big eyeballs can actually see them. Um, and so the way this is done is to do the dilution series and then spot these out. And this is really a technique that's agnostic to whether you're uh, doing synthetic biology, antibiotic discovery, or just wanting to count the number of microbes um, on your hands. I mean, all of these techniques are the same. They come down to growing colonies on solid media. And so this would be what an experiment would actually look like where you have three colonies at this dilution that you can actually count times the number of dilutions that you did gives you how many CFUs per mil. And it turns out that this method was invented or first proposed in 1938. So you give a sense of time that this has uh, lasted. This is a very robust method and people have been using it because it's simple and straightforward and reliable. These are really uh, key ingredients of a, a good technology. So it was proposed in 1938 in this paper, and we've been doing it ever since. So the problem with this technique is that it is enormously time consuming and it has a rather huge carbon footprint as measured in plastic waste. Because once you go from one sample to say now 96 samples that you wanted to measure CFUs. So if we we're going to put on those glasses and be able to see CFUs all around us, a heat map of the world in terms of bacterial load, you're going to need to be able to do quite a few CFU measurements. And the current technology would say you need 16 pipette tip boxes for 96 samples. And there's uh, there many a graduate student who has been seen buried behind these mountains of tip boxes as they try and run all these dilution series in order to quantify their bacterial load. Maybe more importantly for uh, lazy postdocs is that it takes so long to do this. So even for 96 samples, uh, it's going to take three hours to run the dilution series um, and, and then play them out. So, so this is the problem. Now, I want you to suspend disbelief for a minute and just we're going to walk through a thought experiment and then we'll see if we can actually implement this in real life. So our idea, the germinal center of idea is, can we use geometry to run a dilution series for us? So if you had a cone and you were able to suspend the bacteria in the cone and shake the cone up, where colonies would form would be proportional to the cross-sectional area of that cone as a distance from the tip. 
So out at the very tip, because there's not very much volume out there, you would expect there's a low probability of finding a colony to form there. Whereas at the base, which has a higher cross-sectional area, you're more likely to find a colony. And we can actually write down the equation for what is this probability as a function of distance from the tip. And rarely in mathematics or biology do you get an equation as simple and beautiful as this. You can actually show this to biology audiences and physics audiences alike. But the equation is simply that the probability of finding a colony as a function of distance from the tip, which is along x here, is x squared times 3 over the length of the cone cubed. And that's it. So that's the probability function. Now to turn, what's really remarkable about this equation is actually what's not in this equation. And that is that you don't actually care about y and z. You don't care where in the cross-sectional uh, slice your colony is. You just care that it's in that slice. And so this simplifies dramatically the amount of information you need to only the distance from x. So how would you turn this into a CFU count? So you would pick two positions in the cone and begin counting the number of colonies between those two positions, x1 and x2. And that's your numerator. And then the denominator is the volume of your cone times the integral of this probability density function between those two points. And what this part of the equation is, is what percentage of the volume did you count? And this is the number of colonies you counted in that volume. So then you get number of colonies per volume. And this is how you get CFUs per mil. And once you see this equation, it becomes pretty clear why a cone is a useful thing. Because if you had a cylinder, your probability density function is constant as a function of distance along, you know, each slice of salami along this cylinder has the same probability of finding a colony in it. And so it's a flat line. You get, uh, if you turn it into a wedge, now you get a little bit more dynamic range in your probability density function. But the cone, which changes shape in all three dimensions simultaneously, gives you the maximum dynamic range and therefore the maximum dynamic range in the CFUs per mil that you could reliably discriminate. So as we thought about this, is like this is a really cool math idea. If only there were some kind of disposable, cheap, plastic, cone-like object on every microbiologist bench, that would be amazing. Uh, and it, you know, it probably hits you faster than it hit us. But yes, you all have one on your bench, and this is called a pipette tip. There it is. There's a cone. And so we did the really simple, silly experiment of taking a bacteria sample for which we knew the concentration of bacteria because we'd done the drop CFU um, plating way. And then we took that sample and we ran a dilution series of it so that we would know in each sample how many CFUs there should be. And then we treated each one of those dilutions like a sample of unknown concentration of bacteria. Then we melted some agros with uh, media, so LB agros, we mix it with our cells, and then we do the one thing microbiologists are really, really bad at, and that's what we let it stay in the tip. We actually dunk it in ice so it solidifies in the tip, and then you do something uber sacrilegious, and that is you eject the tips back in the tip box. So this is like a nightmare, I know, for most microbiologists. But what comes out after you incubate the tips for a day is colonies form, and the colonies form in a distribution that reflects the number of CFUs per mil that were in that sample. So as your intuition suggested, if you don't have very many CFUs per mil, you end up with very few colonies and the, they tend to be found more toward the base. Whereas as you have increasing concentrations of CFUs per mil, you increasingly find colonies near the tip all the way out here to 10 to the seven CFUs per mil. And we find lots and lots of these really tiny colonies way out at the tip. So this is six, seven orders of magnitude across which we can discern individual colonies in order to quantify them. So how, how good do we actually do? So because we know that we were doing a dilution series of fourfold each time, we know that the CFU should drop by a factor of four. And so the slope on this plot should be one. So when we actually did the experiment, we see that the slope is highly linear, 1.05 with an R squared of 0.998. And I told the undergrad who was working with me, I said, never ever will you get a 0.9 something in biology. So really enjoy this moment. And she likes to prove me wrong. Um, and so when we actually looked at the correlation between the 
the drop CFU, the standard way people have been doing this for a hundred years and the way we did it using the distribution within the pipette tip, we have a correlation of 0.98 across six orders of magnitude. So this is a highly uh, reproducible and correlated to the standard measurements in the field. Just for uh, your own edification, these were P200 pipette tips. The math works well with P1000s or P10s or We've never tried P10s just because they're so small, but you can do it with other sizes. Um, we've tested a lot of different species of bacteria. Um, we've done gram positive like uh, Bacillus. We've done gram negatives um, like uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Pseudomonas is a great example because some people uh, wonder whether what's the oxygen diffusion within the pipette tip. And Pseudomonas is an obligate aerobe. They would not grow without any oxygen. So the fact that we get colonies says there is adequate oxygen diffusion into the tip. We've done eukaryotic species like uh, Saccharomyces. Um, and then uh, a, a slew of others with different collaborators across the world. Um, we're really excited. Recently, we got uh, Mycobacterium to work and as well as uh, um, an anaerobic species, Clostridium, uh, one of the uh, key people who's been working on that is hoping to to pull together a, a demonstration of the protocol for anaerobes soon. Um, but I mean, you're not limited to just things that grow in lab, like you can do yogurts from home or wh wherever this is. So wherever there are bacteria, we can count them as long as they're culturable. Um, so this is just a picture of the mycobacterium um, colonies that form in these pipette tips. You can see these are very slow growing. So it takes 14 days for a, a colony to develop. Um, and yet the we really don't see much reduction in the, in the agros over that time. So we're still able to reliably quantify this. So we're very excited about this, uh, this advance. Um, okay, so how far along have we gone toward that uh, vision I proposed at the beginning of uh, glasses that could see CFUs around us? So now that we can do high throughput CFUs, um, a volunteer who shall go unnamed, but is, is a rather goofy looking postdoc, uh, was swabbed extensively to see how many CFUs could be cultured off of various parts of uh, his body. So we did hair, ears, uh, nares, cheeks, uh, watch, things that people don't want to know, like their keyboard or phone. And then we embedded these and just counted the number of CFUs that formed the next day. And the audience will be uh, gratified to know that hand washing still does work. So this is uh, my left hand, pre-wash, and then post-wash, it goes below the limit of detection. Uh, unfortunately, it looks like I don't wash my right hand quite as well. So uh, this is a concerning trend, but this gives a sense of why having high throughput viability measurements could enable that kind of world where we can see how many microbes exist around us, all the way from very high concentrations in my ear down to none after I wash my hands. Okay, so how well have we done toward the goal of reducing the time and carbon footprint of viability assays? So I said it's hard to do and takes a lot of time. So 16 tip boxes, 16 petri dishes for 96 conditions. Um, in order to run a drop CFU assay. In GVA, each sample now becomes its own pipette tip. So you reduce by 16 fold the number of pipette tips you need because every single sample is in a pipette tip now and you're doing the mixing step in that same pipette tip. So uh, we have for 96 conditions is now one tip box worth of pipette tips. And maybe more importantly for uh, uh, lazy postdocs like me would be how much time does this take? So for 96 conditions with a 12 channel pipetter, I've been doing a box in about four minutes. So that's just the, the preparation step that doesn't involve the, the imaging and the, the counting step. But just in terms of time spent uh, actively pipetting, it reduced it by 36 fold. So now I do uh, one tip box in four minutes. And this has left me at the point where I'm fairly confident I can do about 1200 CFUs in a day. Um, I'm still annoyed at that point, but this is about 10 times more than I was willing to do beforehand. So uh, if you're a PI, what you should hear is that you can get 10 times the amount of data for the same amount of strain on your postdocs. For postdocs, you can hear it takes 36 times less in order to do this. Okay. Uh, in order to disseminate this, we have created a web page. Uh, the link is in the slides. You're also welcome to see, uh, uh, email me if you have trouble getting access. But 
on the web page, we've included all uh, videos of how to install the software, how to download the code, frequently asked questions. There's a help email. So this is a fairly advanced website that we hope will enable other people to set this up in their own lab. To just give you some technical details, how have we done this? Turns out taking pictures of pipette tips is not something most uh, people spend their time figuring out how to do. So we had to kind of invent our own. Um, this is a system that uh, I designed and built, which uses just a commercial mirrorless camera. So you could buy this at a camera store with a macro lens. And then there's some uh, custom circuitry in order to control a stepper motor with 3D printed components that hold the pipette tip stereotypically in front of the, the mirror. So this can take pictures of uh, 12 at a time, and this uh, speeds up rapidly how many pipette tips you can take uh, pictures of. After you take the pictures, there's a, a software that I wrote which is designed to uh, enable you to segment the colonies and count them and run the GBA calculations. It's semi-automated, so the user still can go in and, and click and, and uh, select colonies, or there's an automated segmentation guess that will give you like, well, this is my best guess for the colony segmentation. Um, and that software is also open uh, source and available on the web page, so you should uh, feel free to download it. But we know that the camera system is kind of a, a, a big buy-in for a lot of people. So we also decided to see, could we do this with uh, just an iPhone camera? So for the iPhone camera, we, again, 3D printed some parts to hold the pipette tip stereotypically in front of the iPhone against a, a, a monochromatic backdrop. So we found white works well with ambient lighting. Um, and we were curious, you know, how does this affect the accuracy of GBA? And what we see is that the, the correlation between the GBA counts determined from the iPhone versus the Canon camera are highly correlated. So you have a 0.99 correlation over uh, five orders of magnitude or so, but you lose dynamic range. You're no longer able to resolve those really, really tiny colonies in the pipette tip at the high concentrations resulting in about a 64-fold decrease in the dynamic range. Still highly linear across the range of which it uh, is uh, useful. Um, and so that's a slope uh, of 1.04 is the green line. That's the iPhone uh, with an R squared of 0.99. And um, so our conclusion out of this is that the optics determines the dynamic range but not the accuracy of GBA. So it's very accurate regardless of your uh, optics, but the dynamic range is set by how small is the smallest colony you can resolve. Okay, so it turns out that the math is actually so simple, you can even encode it on a piece of paper. So um, this is a, a paper ruler that we designed that allows you to line up your pipette tip. And then you look at this tick marks, which are in log scale and find which one is closest to the 10th colony from the tip. And once you're at the 10th colony from the tip, you uh, count or you read off from this scale, what is the CFUs per mil? So if your 10th colony from the tip was right here, this would be uh, two times 10 to the three CFUs per mil. Uh, this is great to be deployed in low resource areas. It's also kind of fun for kids. We've been doing this with kids um, here in Boulder. Uh, there's a software link that'll let you generate your own rulers for arbitrary configuration. Say you want to do it with P1000s. Um, and again, the accuracy is very high, but the dynamic range is reduced because your eyeballs just can't see colonies much smaller. Um, this, so this dynamic range is 64 fold less. And this was with me using a, a magnifying glass. So if you don't have magnifying glass, it's probably another uh, tenfold lower than that. So this kind of sets the dynamic range at which you can use these, but um, for many people, forward is magnitude will be plenty enough to, to measure the systems they're interested in. Um, again, a high correlation, 0.99 between the paper version and the, the camera version of this. Okay, so how many colonies do I need to count? That's a question we get a lot. Uh, this is an error as a function of the number of colonies that have been counted. And it turns off you're off by a factor of less than two after only counting 10 colonies. 
And so this is at CFUs of 100 CFUs per mil. So it's reasonable to ask, well, what if I have more? And it turns out that the shape of this curve is invariant to how many CFUs you have in your, in your pipette tip. So if you have lots and lots of CFUs per mil um, or very few, by the time you get to the 10th colony in the pipette tip, you're within a factor of two 97% of the time. And that's invariant um, to sampling. Uh, and what this is really a good example of the, the amount of information encoded in the geometry. There's a lot of latent information in just knowing where things are within a cone that allow you to count far fewer colonies than you would otherwise and still retain high accuracy because you're using information that you would have otherwise thrown away. Um, in terms of how robust is GBA to uh, noise variation, so the way we tested this was we took a sample, ran a dilution series with it, and then we looked at uh, the coefficient of variation, which is the standard deviation divided by the mean, uh, between four technical replicates. So these should have the exact same CFU concentrations. How much standard deviation divided by the mean do, uh, variation do we get? And the coefficient of variation uh, for GVA has a noise profile that actually lines up whether you're using the Canon camera or the iPhone or the paper version. Um, so the Canon's in green, iPhone is in blue, and the paper's in uh, pink here. And the, the profile actually it has a name. This is called heteroscedastic noise, meaning that you have higher noise at lower concentrations. And that makes sense because you just get down to the point where there's maybe one or two colonies. So there's a lot more noise in your system. But over the range of 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 8, those 4 is magnitude, you have actually lower coefficient of variation between samples than you would using the drop CFU. The drop CFU noise is actually fairly homogenous. And that's because you're counting, if you, you know, you're going to count five or six colonies, but if you get to 10 colonies, you're probably counting the next dilution down. So you always are counting, you know, 10 or fewer colonies, which means that your noise profile is basically the same across all samples. We also did quite a bit of analysis to figure out how robust GVA is to human errors, like missing colonies or cone imperfections. Like does your pipette tip actually need to be a cone in order for this to work? Um, again, because there's so much information uh, encoded in this in the geometry of the problem, it turns out you don't really need that many CF. Uh, you can miss several uh, CFU colonies and still be correct. So what we have here is the number of colonies that were missed, and these are experimental tips. Uh, there are 23 tips that were binned for 10 to the 3 to 10 to the 5 CFUs, 10 to the 5, 10 to the 7 had 30 pipette tips, and 10 to the 7, 10 to the 9 had 30 pipette tips. Mm -hmm. And in those pipette tips, we went in and, and just missed up to 10 colonies uh, from counting about 20 to 25 colonies. And we found that we were off by less than a factor of 1.5, regardless of the CFU concentration in those tips. Um, so it does increase monotonically, but you're still within that factor of two, uh, which is larger often than biological noise would be. Um, you're more sensitive to position errors. So if you don't actually have a good uh, mark of where the end of the pipette tip is, you tend to have more error. Um, and, and that's true more so for high CFU concentrations rather than low CFU concentrations. But in all these cases, you still asymptotically approach you know, being off by a factor of two or so, which isn't actually all that much in these log scale uh, measurements. Okay, so briefly, I'm gonna talk about uh, one of the use cases we did with this, and this was a screen against stationary phase bacteria. So stationary phase bacteria are resistant to most antibiotics compared to exponentially growing cells. Um, these are three uh, clinical drugs, carbenicillin, ciprofloxacin, genomycin, which all act against uh, bacteria in a different way. Um, but in all cases, the stationary phase, which are green, are uh, more resistant to increasing concentrations of this drug than the exponentially growing cells. So we ran a screen of uh, 560, 500, um, it's actually 550 compounds uh, plus controls 
with two biological replicates, two growth phase. Uh, we did both exponential and stationary phase and then looked at how many CFU measurements uh, in total is about 2,300 CFU measurements. And this would take like 50 some odd pipette tip boxes um, or it was like 300 pipette tip boxes for the drop CFU, but with GBA, um, this re is reduced to about 23 pipette tip boxes. So um, what we found is across this library, there are obviously lots of things that don't do anything. There were a couple interesting ones. Mitomycin C is a known antibiotic. So it's kind of like nice. It was in our panel and we see that yes, we do pull out known antibiotics. One that was kind of interesting to us was this uh, DPI compound, which is uh, nominally a drug against um, NOx enzymes in mammalian cultures, which are responsible for processing uh, reactive oxygen species. So uh, it's thought that DPI treatment in, in uh, like cancer context is to reduce uh, ROS. And this kind of was curious to us because many antibiotics are thought to function through elevating ROS levels. And so we were curious, like, how does this molecule work? When we looked at how much ROS was generated at um, when treating with DPI, these are single cell um, mean traces over time. And we see that uh, looking at superoxide levels, we see an increase in ROS uh, generation over time that's monotonic in Cipro, so that's the orange. Uh, the control kind of goes up, but then levels off as the dye um, intercalates. DPI does what we think would initially, it kind of follows the control and then it it dips down. So this would be the ROS inhibition, but then it paradoxically spikes up again. And so this, we are wondering, like, does this secondary spike, is this the bactericidal activity of DPI? And to test this, we tested viability in aerobic and anaerobic conditions. And we did find that, yes, anaerobic conditions are um, required, or aerobic conditions are required for the bactericidal activity up to um, a factor of uh, tenfold more potent. Um, this led us to think that it is indeed the raw spike that is part of uh, DPI's activity. We had some other data that showed uh, the formation of filaments in DPI treatment leading to us uh, think that the SOS pathway, the SOS pathway had been activated uh, upon DPI treatment. Um, and then when we looked at knockouts, so this is using GVA again to measure viability, um, what we found is that if you knocked out the NOx-like targets in E. coli, so YEDZ and FRE are the uh, Nox like genes and E. coli, there's really no significant change in sensitivity, but Rec A mediated um, activity of the SOS pathway was critical for the efficacy of DPI, particularly against the wild type cells. So, uh, in conclusion, we were interested if whether or not this uh, aberrant activation of the SOS pathway by DPI could antagonize other. SOS dependent antibiotics. So ciprofloxacin is known to depend on uh, how much SOS activation there is. And so we did viability checkerboards where we looked at increasing concentrations of DPI, increasing concentrations of Cipro. So the heat map here is viability log CFUs. So this would be near 10 to the 10 CFUs per mil all the way down to uh, below limit of detection. Similarly, DPI itself is uh, cytotoxic, but at this intermediary dose of, CP, uh, of ciprofloxacin, DPI actually can antagonize cipro significantly, rescuing by almost three orders of magnitude. So this line trace here is this pulled out here. So um, interestingly, we don't observe this antagonism on a plate reader, which suggests really this uh, need for high throughput viability measurements to discern these kinds of interactions. And if we staggered the dosing, um, if we pre-treat with ciprofloxacin, we reduce the protective effect of DPI. If we pre-treat with DPI, we slightly increase that effect. So this gives us the ability to uh, more confidence that DPI is antagonizing Cipro through activation. Okay, so in summary, what have I hoped to convey to you is that, that, you know, available to you now is the ability to do high throughput viability measurements. And really the plate reader has made 
high throughput growth inhibition standard for most laboratories. GBA, we feel, will make it universally available to do high throughput viability measurements. And uh, we hope that uh, to save graduate students in the future from being able buried under pipette tip boxes and enable that future where we all can see the amazing microbial world that we live in. And with that, the science is definitely a team sport. There's a lot of great uh, collaborators, particularly Joel Kral, who is my former mentor and co-inventor of this technique. Um, Dr. Corey Detweiler, whose lab I'm currently working in, has really pioneered bringing this technique into other labs as well as others on this page. So uh, thank you so much to the funding sources and your attention. And I'm really happy to take questions. At this point, I'm going to uh, refer to uh, Dr. Moon as whether or not he wants to jump in at this point. But thank you for your attention. Well, fantastic talk. So I really love it because I also concerned about a lot of plastic waste we generate as a researcher. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Address, I mean, your method would uh, could you know address some of the problem we currently have. So let me let me start with the my question. So I know I mean the CFU measurement probably the most accurate method for you know live cell count I guess. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I also remember from literature there are alternative way. Uh, I mean, some other way than what you just you know presented you know, beautifully today, including using I don't know a uh, flow cytometer that potentially counts number of cells. There are some machine uh, focusing on only counting cell numbers, and also. Probably more, you know, lab heavy, but even qPCR could, you know, count some same number. Could you kind of give us kind of comparison between or among those methods? What is the pros and what is the cons of those kind of methods? Because many people use different methods. Yeah, sure, absolutely. So, um, you're absolutely right that the uh, the colony growth assay is has its problems. And there are many people who are working to show that, you know, not everything that goes down on a dish eventually grows. They're actually, so you, the equation between one to one cells to colonies is not true. Um, so that is a problem. And GVA has the exact same problem. We did not fix that problem at all. Um, I'm currently using GBA to look at how changing the kinds of embedding conditions could potentially rescue some of those cells that are, you know, maybe viable, but non dividing or, or at least prompt them into growth. Um, so that's some exciting work that's been done right now in terms of using more sophisticated technologies like flow cytometry or qPCR. All of these are great techniques. Uh, however, they run into prohibitively time or cost uh, expensive. And that's why people have kind of relied, I think, on CFUs is that, uh, you know, trying to do 96 samples from a flow cytometer would be a challenge, but trying to do 12,000 samples from a flow cytometer would be impossible. Um, similarly, for qPCR, it becomes very expensive in terms of the reagents that you're using. Um, over and over again. So the one of the things that GBA, uh, I think, accomplished that has made the CFU assay so successful is that it's cheap and readily accessible to anybody with a pipette tip and some agros, whereas a flow cytometer requires a huge investment in the instrument and uh, QPCR, obviously, uh, quite a bit of investment in instrumentation as well as reagents. So... Um, I, I do think that there's a place for other uh, technologies, dye-based technologies. Um, but in terms of just bulk counting, I don't think colony counts are going to disappear anytime soon. That definitely, you know, I, that's how I feel. That's why we also rely on the uh, colony counting. Uh, and then we, of course, use the dilution. Uh, but you know, diluting one hundred seventh 
just from the one sample to you know 107 dilution that's not accurate so we basically do serial dilution for every experiment but now i realize still hate that i mean doing dilution because there's a lot of work <laughs> it's a lot of work and a lot of waste yeah, yeah a lot of wasted plastic we didn't we didn't solve the counting problem exactly um because we still have to count colonies uh that have that video of so this software that i wrote does allow for i think a pretty user friendly way of colony counting but at the end of the day you still have to count the colonies and so um in terms of the time saving of GBA, it's all in the experimental prep side. It's not as much in the uh, colony counting and the um, uh, analysis side. So, that, you know, there's things that are not going to change. We're, we are improving using machine learning, the automated segmenter. So we're hoping to get to the place where the pipette tips are fully automatedly seg segmented no matter what. Um, but we're not there yet. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, I mean, the way we actually try to save the plastic, we actually do not use whole plate for the colony counting. We use the spot, and then in yep. the spot, we just count. And then by the time with the right dilution, uh, we have sufficient uh, colony that separate each other, but still that does not solve the problem of using a lot of pipette tips because we kind of use the pipette tips for the dilution later on. So your method is absolutely, you know, exciting. I hope, I mean, a lot of people adopt those technology in that way, you know, we save the plastic uh, much more further because during pandemic, even we have the shortage <laughs> of the plastic supply. Yeah, in the yeah this could have been more useful when the pipette tips were uh were vanishing from shelves. Yeah. Wonderful. So I now see 11 or three of my time. And let me check whether we have a question from audience. I do not see it now. So let me close and then we have, you know, additional session. Okay. Great. Amazing talk again. I, I did love it. Uh, thank you all for joining and staying today. We'll meet again on February 8th, Thursday, the same time, the same Zoom link. We'll have Professor Har Arper at UT Austin and Professor Helen Jia and RPI. As usual, the follow informal chat will occur with our recording. Please stay here if you are interested in chatting with us. I'll promote you to panelists who can speak and show your handsome and pretty face if you wish, and thanks, I will stop recording. Just give me one second.